Can we hear? Can you hear me? Sound good? All right. Good evening. Welcome. We got a full house tonight, which is pretty exciting. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. We are the South Wake Conservationists. My name is Monty Moray. I'm president of the South Wake Conservationists. And um, we are having a dual program tonight. We do this live here at Bass Lake every three months, but we also do a webcast. So we're doing doing this as a Zoom meeting and there are people all, all across the state that are also interested in some of these topics. So they'll, they'll be watching from afar. So uh, that also, when people that aren't able to make it can see this on a recording, which will be available on the North Carolina Wildlife Federation website next week. I think it's about a week it takes to get those up there. So um, anyway, welcome. We are an all volunteer organization. We are part of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. We're the chapter that serves central and southern Wake County. And our mission is to conserve and restore wildlife and habitat diversity through conservation projects, which we do a lot of, and also through public education, which we also do quite a bit in community engagement. Um, we have guest speakers. Uh, every time we have these meetings, there's a guest speaker who we'll introduce momentarily. And we also do webinars that are not in person, but just webinars. And we also have guest speakers for that. Um, we have other programs. We've got a pretty high focus on kids. We have a program we started two years ago, two and a half years ago, called Eco Kids. And we'll talk a little more about that in a minute, but uh, that's, a, that's a pretty exciting, trying to get kids engaged with nature. And uh, I think we have some engaged kids over here, which is good to see. Um, we also have exhibits that we do at local events. Jeff over here heads up the committee that does that. So these various uh, Arbor Day festivals and various other festivals around the Raleigh area will have educational materials available and, and interacting with people about that. Uh, we do field trips, but we do a lot of conservation projects. We make pollinator gardens. We plant trees. I think there's a tree planting at the, at the art park uh, tomorrow, as an example. Um, we also do watershed cleanups, we do invasive plant removals, we do wildlife habitat projects, putting out bluebird houses. How many would you put out now, Jeff? 50 some, pretty close, yeah. And now we're diversifying, we're gonna get some other kinds of uh, houses for uh, other kinds of animals. And we have a deer program. So a lot to do, everybody has different interests, but I encourage you, those that are new, check out our website, you can see the different activities. Um, and subscribe and you'll see when things are scheduled, just come, right? Nothing to it, it's all free. We are also having, and this is my personal plug here, we're having our third annual Kids in Nature Day event, which is on May 4th. And uh, that's, that's our biggest activity or biggest event that we hold in, in a year. Uh, this is our third year doing it. Uh, it's been very popular. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into getting ready for it, but it's, it's well worth it. The kids love it. It's a lot of fun. It's going to be at Lake Benson Park uh, in Garner on May 4th, the afternoon. And if you go to the website, you'll see all the details. It's up there now. Um, and we're also looking for volunteers. So if you are interested in volunteering at that event, we would love to have you. There's a lot of different jobs available. They don't pay very well, but they're a lot of fun. So we'd love to have you do that. And if you are interested, there's you can scan a QR code here on the back table to sign up uh, to the uh, to be a volunteer as well as on the website. And of course, we're always looking for donations uh, towards the Kids in Nature Day event. So if you are so inclined and would like to contribute, we'd love to see that too. There's another QR code for that and it's on the website. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce Luke Bennett. Luke is the conservation coordinator from the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And we work very closely on an ongoing basis and he's going to moderate tonight's program and give you a little bit more of the, how we're gonna do Q and A. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I'm the air traffic control essentially tonight on the Zoom. So we are broadcasting this on Zoom and uh, thanks for the folks in person. We also have, I think, over 50 people that signed up online as well. And we're going to save some time at the end for questions. If you're online and would like to ask a question, we definitely encourage you to do so. We're going to save some time at the end. Uh, so there's going to be a Q&A button or chat at the bottom of your screen, and you can type in a question at any point during the presentation. It's not going to break the presentation or anything like that. And then we'll try to save some time at the end to get to as many questions as we can. So I'll hand it back over to Monty here, and we'll get started. Thank you, Luke. All right. So it is my pleasure tonight 
to have a speaker that is a popular environmental educator um, at Wake County's Crowder Park and has also been a good friend and, and uh, partner to us in, the, in this chapter. We spent a lot of time together and it's just wonderful to work with. And we're, we feel fortunate to uh, have her. Um, her enthusiasm for connecting people, especially kids with nature is absolutely contagious. And uh, if there's any reptile questions out there, you have come to the right place. So please welcome Sarah Goldsmith. Hello, everybody. All right. So we are here today to learn a little bit about turtles. Um, so if you're here, you might know a little bit already. You might know nothing. That is okay. Um, so here, we're just going to be talking about the turtles that we're going to be finding in Wake County. So the county we're currently in. Um, we are going to touch on maybe a little bit of the turtles that are outside, but mainly it's going to be our Wake County turtles. Okay. Um, so to get started, I am Sarah Goldsmith. Hello. It's nice to meet you. Um, so I am an environmental educator over at Crowder County Park and his store Gates Mill County Park. Um, and I, if you've ever been to Crowder County Park, it's kind of known as like Turtle Park. So we have quite a lot of turtles that come through there. If you're in there during the spring, it's really hard to look in the water and not see like 100 turtles at a time. We have two uh, common snapping turtles there named Beach Ball and Volleyball uh, based off their sizes. Um, so they can get up to about 28 pounds in our pond. So uh, it's a small pond, but they seem to be taking up quite a bit of space there. So we're going to be uh, just talking about all the things in Wake County. So that includes the different habitats that these guys might live in. So we have things such as our streams, rivers, ponds mainly, um, some bogs and stuff. Um, so Wake County has a whole bunch of different habitats that go on. Um, and all of them house at least one of our native turtles. So here are gonna be, ooh, okay. Here are gonna be our native turtle species. So these are the locals that you're probably used to seeing. Up top is our painted turtle. So that guy's gonna be our most common turtle here in North Carolina. So if you ever see one kind of basking on a log, chances are it's probably gonna be your painted. And there are some ways that you can really tell the differences between these guys that we'll get into um, on their each individual slides. But for now, um, we got our painted turtle, our yellow belly slider, our river cooter, Florida cooter, <laughs> spotted turtle, your striped mud turtle, your eastern mud turtle. So some of these guys are pretty similar as we can see. Our musk turtle, he's looking a little funky. Uh, our eastern box turtle's looking a little angry. And then the big head of our common snapping turtle. So with these guys, um, these are going to be some of the ones that kind of get close towards Wake County, but the odds of you running into them are pretty low. Um, so we have the Diamondback Terrapin. It's gonna be a little bit more of a coastal turtle um, that's really liking more saltwater regions. Um, you have a chicken turtle. So it's named a chicken turtle because it is normally poached uh, for their meat because it tastes like chicken. So <laughs> odd, I personally wouldn't eat it, but you know what, to each their own. Um, and so these guys are going to be a little more native, but as you can see, they don't quite make it into Wake County. Um, you have the bog turtle, which is going to be the smallest turtle in all of North America. Um, they only get full size, about four inches. You can maybe find one four and a half inches, but um, pretty tiny guys. Um, we have our northern red belly cooter, a lot of different types of cooters that we have. Um, but these guys are a little bit more north and coastal. Um, so we don't really run into them too much. Um, ours are more of the Florida and the river cooter. And then the spiny soft shell. So that's like the only soft shell we're gonna have in North Carolina. And their shell is soft and it kind of feels like the back of your ear. So it's a little bit weird of a texture, um, but you know, it does open them up to a little bit more predation. Um, but as you can see, it's barely touching Wake County, but probably not gonna come across these guys. They're pretty elusive. Um, so normally, probably not going to come across them. And if you do come across a soft shell, the odds of it being the Chinese soft shell, which is going to be our invasive, is a little bit higher than ever coming across this guy. So there it is. We're just going to talk just quickly about some common adaptations that are in these freshwater turtles. So one of them is respiration. So they do breathe using their lungs. It's not the only way they breathe. So it's a little bit of a fun fact that kids really tend to run with. They can breathe out of their butts. Um, interesting choice, but you know what? It's um, it's actually near their cloaca, which is what they use for going to the bathroom. 
and laying eggs and apparently breathing. So it's a big catch all. Um, I'd prefer to keep all that separate, but you know what? That's on them. So uh, another cool thing about their ability um, for respiration is they tend to keep the air inside so they can determine how high or low in the water they can go. Uh, so their buoyancy can change depending on how much air they have in them. So it's kind of a cool way to bounce through the water on their own accord. Um, another cool thing is going to be their temperature dependent sex determination. So basically what that means is when they lay their eggs, they always have to lay their eggs on land. So since turtles, you know, breathe air, they don't have everything developed in the egg stage in order to be able to breathe underwater like the turtles can when they are fully developed. So they need to be uh, laid on land to make sure that the eggs can still get air and oxygen to grow. Um, and also when it comes to the temperature dependent sex determination, um, more colder temperatures are gonna produce males on average. And then females are a little bit more warmer temperatures. So depending on how warm it is outside and if the turtle decided to lay the nest in the sun or maybe in the shade, it can change because all of them can pop up one gender or another depending on how cold or warm it is. Um, and then one more thing is gonna be their limbs and feet. So if you've ever seen a sea turtle, they tend to have a little bit more of a flipper going, not, don't have a lot of digits on their limbs. Um, but these guys are going to have webbed fingers, which makes it a little bit easier for them to swim, but they need those claws to be able to grab onto rocks or to get out of river banks um, or even for laying their eggs. So um, they tend to have a little bit more clear digits that you can see. There it is. So this is gonna be our local invasive turtle. So you guys probably seen him um, or have seen maybe hybrid versions of him. So this is gonna be our red belly slider, uh, not a red belly slider, our red eared slider. And he is pretty obviously named for the bright red on his ears that go right across. Um, these guys are in the slider family with the yellow bellied sliders. So the big issue with these guys is that when they're born, they're this big, they're so cute. They're little containers. They got rainbow rocks on the bottom. Everybody wants them, they're adorable. And they don't realize, give it four years, they get this big and then even bigger until you're dealing with something like this. And they don't really have the space or resources to take care of these animals. So a lot of the invasive turtles you see are probably pet releases or have come from a previous pet release. Um, so it's a big issue. They're very commonly traded. Um, they're probably, I, actually they are in the top 100 invasive species in the world. So they are pretty invasive. Um, they are normally found along the Mississippi River. So kind of close, but not quite here. So, um, but they are taking over a lot of the resources our yellow-bellied sliders rely on. Do you have a question? Questions, we're going to need another oh, we can wait. We can wait till. Do you mind waiting till the end, John? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That makes sense. All right. So um, we'll hold the questions till the end. Sorry, John. Um, <laughs> but um, so a lot of the time with these guys, it's pet releases. Um, and it's also kind of an ongoing cycle. So if you go to a park and you see a turtle with a red ear and you're like, oh, I have a turtle with a red ear. I can't take care of him anymore. I'm just going to release him because his friends are there. Don't. Please don't. Um, next thing you know, there's three and then there's four and they breed and it becomes a whole cycle of an issue. Um, so we try to make sure that any pet releases don't happen regardless of species, but these guys are going to be the real issue when it comes to that. So now we're going to get into our native turtle species a little bit. So we're starting with our yellow bellied slider. So that's going to be this guy right here. So this is a replica. Um, this guy is actually a turtle. So this is a, um, a replica of one, um, but their biggest features on them is going to be the big striping that they have um, right next behind their eye. It sometimes goes in the shape of an S, but it's usually a big yellow bar right behind their eye. So um, they also tend to have a little bit more domed of a shell um, and their back section of their shell tends to be very um, serrated. So a lot of ridges on it. So with these guys, that's kind of a quick way you can tell just from above um, what turtle you're looking at. The big thing is gonna be that yellow bar. Um, but an issue we're having is they are hybridizing with the red-eared sliders. 
So sometimes they'll come out without a bar or they'll have an orange marking going on or it's just completely random. So um, when you have too many hybrids, it becomes a little bit harder to identify them from other turtles. So um, I know that there are some groups with NC State who are working on doing some genetic research to try to see maybe how long these turtles have been in our pond, just to kind of track it back a few generations. Um, but they're doing some great work over there and we'll get into that in a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, these, um, this is the same shell of one that you can tell was injured at one point in time, but just kind of like us, our bones healed back. So, so did this guy and he was able to kind of continue on to a full life. You can see it fully healed around. Um, so he was able to kind of keep on going after that injury, which is great. They're super resilient. Turtles are amazing at healing. So next we have our river cooter. So the picture you can see, he looks very similar to that of a yellow-bellied slider. Um, the biggest difference is going to be their shape of their shell. Um, so this is thought of a river cooter. It's a lot flatter. It's a little more streamlined. Um, they're found on more moving waters, so they need to be able to move a little quicker. So the streamlined shell helps them with that. Um, they also don't have that bar right there. They do have yellow striping, but they don't have that clear bar that you can tell on a uh, yellow belly. Another thing is... Kind of hard to notice, but um, on the sides of their uh, carapace, they have those um, black dots. So those are also on a yellow belly, but for them, it's a little bit more of a hollow dot. So you can kind of see it where you have the black circle and a little bit of yellow in the middle. And if you see it on a yellow belly, it's just a pure black dot on the side. A little bit harder of a way to notice. So you're probably better off looking at the shell shape um, and the same with the bar on the ear. But um, just if you happen to get one really up close, that's another way that you can kind of tell the differences. And next we have a Florida cooter. So these are very similar to that of a river cooter. Um, they're in the same family. Um, the biggest way to tell the difference is, I don't know if you can notice, but there are big red stripings going down the bottom of that, or the top of the carapace. Um, so that's gonna be the biggest feature you can tell the difference of them. They do have a little bit more of a dome shell and it's thicker because in Florida, there's a lot more alligators and things like that, bigger predators that are able to bite on them that we don't have here. So the Florida cooter has adapted to have a thicker shell to kind of help protect them against these bigger predators that they're not normally used to. So um, not just the shape, um, but also that red stripe is gonna be the biggest difference. So next is our painted turtles. So these are the most common turtles that we have here. So the big way you can tell the difference is um, on these guys, they have those stripings that go down. Um, so these are going to be the only turtles in all of the world that have their um, their scoot seams are in a line. So you can see that their scoots are like everything that's on the back of them. So actually, it's easier to see on this turtle, but all of these scoots that can pop off and shed. So each one of these is a scoot and they just pop right off and they shed with them. So all reptiles shed and that's just their way of shedding because they have to grow and so does their back. So um, the seams in between those scoots are in a line. And this is gonna be the only animal you can see that on. Even the Western uh, painted turtles, the Midland painted and the Southern don't have that. So um, also it's gonna be their bright coloring. So they are very beautifully colored. Um, they tend to have the red around the very base of them that kind of fades off as they go. Um, so you can see that they more have red right around here and it kind of fades into a yellowy orange. They're very beautifully colored, but those stripes are gonna be the most noticeable thing you can see. So then we have our Eastern box turtle. I love our Eastern box turtle. We actually have one right over here. So this was very kindly given to us by the Bass Lake employees. Um, this is Tank. So he is a male and you can tell um, he's an older male as well. Um, the bright colors of his head, so the yellow, will actually get more and more yellow as time goes on. And if you can notice, his eyes are very bright red, like piercingly red. So the male is going to be the one that have these bright red eyes. The females are going to be more brown. Um, he is extremely friendly. Normally they are up in their shell. Um, another thing is, I'm going to show you his, his plasteron, but they always have this indent for the males. It makes it easier to mount the females. Um, so they always have that little indent and I can show you on the actual shells so he doesn't feel like he's upside down and floating. Sarah, can you bring it up? Yeah, yep. 
Hello, everybody at home. This is Tank. <laughs> so this is the box turtle from Bass Lake Center over here, and they were very kind to let us borrow him. But he's got these bright red eyes, uh, and he's got very beautiful coloring. So normally the females are going to be the ones that are more dull in color and a little bit more domed. So this, you don't really see too much of the scoots. They've kind of been popping off over the years. Um, but you can tell that this is all bone underneath. Um, these actually act as their rib cage. So it's like our ribs for them um, kind of goes out and around. And you can see that this actually is their spine right here. So they cannot come out of their shell. They're not like other like mollusks and, or things that can kind of hop out and find a new one. He's not hopping out of nothing. He's growing with this. So this is his actual spine. And then each one of these kind of break off into a rib. So it's what protects them on the outside. It's a little bit backwards, um, but the female is going to be a little more domed and it's very flat on the bottom. There is none of that actual dipping or indent on the um, plasteron. So it's very flat. And if you look on um, this guy, you can see a very clear dent. So that dent is a, always going to be a male. That is a clear cut way to tell. Um, the eyes are a very clear cut way, but it can, you can have a rare case where you do have a female with a bright red eye. Not normally though. So these are gonna be our only terrestrial turtles and they are the North Carolina state reptile. So they were pretty awesome to be our state reptile and Tennessee's state reptile. So some states don't even have a reptile. So he made it to two, he's pretty awesome. Thanks Tank, let's see. Then we have our Eastern mud turtle. So these guys, um, they're little derpy guys. They stay on the bottom of uh, your creeks and slow moving streams. Um, they are like olive green to brownish in color. They don't really have a lot of different patterns on them. They're pretty plain. Um, they aren't great swimmers. So they are aquatic turtles and they spend a lot of their time in the water. They are just really good at crawling on the bottom. They look just like a rock. So they blend in really well. Um, and these guys are very tiny as well. So you can see adult is about 4.75 inches. So it's not very big at all. Um, and these guys also have a relative, which is going to be the striped mud turtle. So as you can see in the picture, very clear striping on the back. In North Carolina, they don't have that. So North Carolina, they don't have that striping on their back, but they do have that striping on their face. So we'll go back real quick. Um, you can see there is not that clear stripe around the eye on the Eastern mud turtle. But when you go to your striped mud turtle, that stripe is there. So even in North Carolina, when they don't have the stripes necessarily on their carapace, they'll have it on their face. So you can tell the difference between the two. You're more likely to run into an Eastern mud turtle than you are gonna be a striped mud turtle, but both of them are still gonna be our common mud loving little guys. So then we have our musk turtles. So these guys are stinking adorable. Um, they are very tiny. They're gonna be the tiniest turtle that we have when they first hatch. So take my water bottle, but they are very, very tiny. So this is probably about a year or two years. Um, they can be even smaller when they first hatch that they reported some that are the size of a nickel. Um, so this guy is also going to be loving the mud. Also not that great of a swimmer, but he has a pretty cool adaptation where those little kind of whiskery things that come off of his face, they're barbells. They're used kind of like whiskers on a cat to kind of determine where you're at because they are more nocturnal than other turtles. Um, so they use that to kind of get around, feel the bottom, and they can also use that reportedly to determine different chemicals in the water or if something is nearby, but not 100% confirmed it can do that. But for now, they just use it like a cat to kind of make sure it can get through different places. Um, and they also have the ability to musk, so hence the musk turtle and stink pot because they stink. So they um, can do the same kind of smell that a skunk can do. Now they can't projectile it, which I'm very happy about, um, but it's just more of like, he'll just go to the bathroom and it's going to stink. So this guy, um, he is named Stink Pot for a very good reason. Um, so a lot of reptiles have the ability to musk. Actually, these big common snapping turtles can musk as well. I'm sure it smells twice as bad, um, but you can see on the range map that we actually have quite a lot of uh, musk turtles in our area. A lot of the time you're not going to see them because they do like to stay really close to the bottom.
Um, and you might notice that stripe on their head when they stick their head out, but normally they are pretty well camouflaged. So the odds of you finding them are kind of low, but they are very common. So they just are amazing hiders. And then we're going to be also talking about this guy. So I have a coworker, Adam Prince, over at Historic Gates Mill, who is extremely kind as to let me borrow his uh, common snapping turtle. This was an alive snapping turtle at some point in time. Now, I walked in here holding it like this, and a lady was like, is that real? And I'm like, not now, not currently. I, I wish I was, you know, a turtle whisperer and could have him balance on my hand, but no. Um, but at one point in time, he was. Um, and this guy is going to be... Um, kind of like the apex predator of the pond regions and the aquatic ecosystems. Um, amazing bite force. So these guys can get pretty big. They've been reported, like I think the biggest one ever recorded was about 75 pounds, quite massive. Um, I wouldn't want to tangle with him. Uh, they have a crazy long neck. So their neck is deceptively long. So if you put your hand like on the side of him, um, anywhere about two thirds up on his shell, you are at risk to be bit. Um, their neck can go all the way back to here. So the only way to actually pick him up is gonna be from the back part of his carapace. Um, and also on under him, on his plasteron, you can kind of cup the bottom of it. I do not recommend attempting to pick these guys up. Please do not. I don't wanna have any liability in that. Um, so, but these guys are a crazy predators. Um, if you guys have ever heard of the alligator snapping turtle, these guys are actually way worse <laughs> and more aggressive uh, than the alligator snapping turtle, despite looks. So the alligators tend to be a little bit more spiky and they just look a little more aggressive. But if you were to put your hand in front of this guy and in front of an alligator snapping turtle, this guy will bite your hand, that guy won't. So this guy, um, he's pretty cool because he does have a really long tail. It's going to be the longest tail on our turtles. Um, and he is the largest turtle that we have in North Carolina. Um, their tails have these spikes on it that is similar to that of like a dinosaur, um, but basically it is bone that is covered in scales. So um, it's just a pretty cool way to have a serrated tail, which sounds awesome. I'm sure it has some great uses, but honestly just looks really cool. Um, and these guys have some crazy uh, strong claws as well. Um, but in their uh, scientific name, it says serpentina because they have a neck that's similar to that of a snake. So they can move it quite long, um, quite fast. So your reflexes are nowhere near that of the turtles. So don't even attempt, just, you know, be like, good, good luck out there um, and move on. Um, but when it comes to helping these guys cross the road, um, the biggest predator of these guys, since they are an apex predator of the pond, uh, like aquatic ecosystem, biggest predator is us. Um, and it's not us hunting them. It is us running them over with cars. So as we grow in population, their regions tend to shrink. So um, they do tend to um, go back to where they normally go for brumation, which is their hibernation. Um, so when they go for brumation and they go to the same spot, if there's a development there, they're still going to attempt to go to that same spot. Um, even if a road has popped up and the road wasn't there before, he will attempt to cross it to get back to where he originally brumated. So a lot of the times he is hit by motor vehicles. Um, and as amazing and strong as the shell is, a motor vehicle is is the winner. Um, so when you do come across these guys and they have to cross the road, there are ways to do it um, that you can do without getting hurt. Do not grab a turtle by the tail. So if this is his spine, his spine goes through his tail. So if you're doing that, you are grabbing him by the spine and I would be pretty mad. So, you know, that doesn't seem very comfortable, but for these guys, um, you can either just kind of grab the back portions of his uh, carapace and drag him. One thing I like to do is to take a real fat stick, put it in front of his face and he grabs onto it and I just drag him. So whatever you can do to just be nowhere near this or that, <laughs> you should be good. Um, but these guys are pretty awesome. Um, they are very aggressive predators. So uh, a lot of the times um, other turtles will be hunted by these guys as well. They have no problem eating. Like if they don't have a lot of live food available, they will even eat some dead animals that they find. They are not picky. Um, so, you know, don't be invited to a dinner party with them. Um, but generally uh, their biggest predator um, is gonna be occurring when they are hatchlings and eggs. Um, so everything, like all of the eggs that I have in here, um, their eggs tend to be a little more leathery. So not like that of a, uh, of a duck egg. 
but um, these eggs were all snapping turtle eggs mixed with some scoots. These are not snapping turtle scoots, but the eggs in here were snapping turtles, um, but they were eaten by a raccoon. So normally you don't think snapping turtle and a raccoon for a predator, um, but when it comes to eggs, they love those eggs. So they will find them, they'll sniff them out, they'll eat them. So the big thing about these snapping turtles is the adults are going to be what really holds the population together. So they can, if they live about, you know, 45, 50 years in the wild, they can lay quite a few clutches. And when they do, a lot of those aren't going to make it. So the biggest thing for their survival is going to be the adults being able to survive longer to lay so many clutches that maybe some will make it to adulthood. So when it comes to us and our motor vehicles, we tend to have a big issue with hitting them and then you know the population will start going down because those clutches aren't being made so even if they're not necessarily making it to adulthood um it's still beneficial you know you're feeding the ecosystem but you know the only way that they're going to survive is to make sure that some of them do make it to that age of being able to kind of become that apex predator that they're known for being so then we have our spotted turtles. So these guys are last because they are the most endangered turtle that we have. They are really adorable, which is a big reason people want them so bad. So these are cuties. They are wanted not only for their ornamental uh, carapace, which is just pretty with their spots. And as they get older, they get more spots. So it's kind of cute, um, but they don't really grow that big. So you can see the biggest one's about adult four and a half inches. So when you deal with an issue of people normally getting their red-eared sliders and they get too big and they release them, you don't have the same issue with these guys. So a lot of the times um, you're not going to be able to find them, or if you do find them, it is recommended that you do not publicize where you found them. Um, poachers will come and they will find them and take them um, to put them into the pet trade. So the biggest thing is that for protecting them, if you do locate one, just help it along its way. Maybe just be like, oh, that's cool. You can snap a picture, but just try not to release that uh, location just to make sure that they can stay protected and continue to breed um, as they would like. Uh, a cool thing about these guys is they like to brumate not in the pond where they are normally found. They will go off and find a nice vernal pool, which is a pool that doesn't have any fish in it where amphibians like to breed. And they will kind of burrow down there. And when the springtime comes, you have a whole bunch of amphibian eggs. And he's like, oh, this is a buffet goes to town and then will make his way over to the pond where he'll spend the rest of his spring and summer. Kind of fall time comes around, around Thanksgiving is when these guys will kind of start to go into their brumation or at least make their trip over to their brumation area. And then they will go back down into that vernal pool, bury themselves and uh, kind of wait until they get more eggs. <laughs> so uh, these guys are just the most endangered one we have. So just the big thing to remember is just don't divulge any information. If you did see one, just be like, cool, I remember that. Awesome. Check that off my personal bucket list and then just move on. So we're going to do a little bit of a quiz. I did not mentally prepare you guys for this, but mentally prepare yourself for right now. Um, so it's going to have a question and then the options are going to be on there. Um, you can read the options. If you feel like you really know it, you don't have to read the options, but we're going to go ahead uh, and start. So how many different types of turtles are in Wake County? Do we have any guesses? Um, what do you got? You can look at the options. 11, oh, yeah, 100%. Do you want to try to help me name them? It's okay if you don't get them all. Okay, you want to try? All right, yellow belly, common snapper, painted turtle. Yep, Eastern box turtle. You can call a friend. <laughs> River cooter. You're doing good. You're, you're, you're really getting them. <laughs> Florida Cooter, we're at six. We're majority there. <laughs> I believe in you. You've gotten this far. <laughs> Red eared slider. Yep. And there's another slider. Oh, you got that slider. What? A, oh, I heard a, a, a nice hint from the back. Spots, 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 spots. Not Dalmatians. <laughs> and definitely not a hundred of them. <laughs> You're okay. Do you want to phone a friend? You you go pick any, any well, not anybody in the room, but <laughs> we're thinking spots. What what's clicking? Slider. 
spotted turtle. There we go. <laughs> we got it. So we're at eight. Um, we're going to keep on going. We got our mud turtle, right? The Eastern, the striped mud turtle and our musk turtle, right? Stink pot, right? That's our musk turtle. Exactly. So we got 11. That was really good. Um, in total in North Carolina, we do have 21 if you include our sea turtles, but we are not doing that. Um, so <laughs> next, why is a box turtle called a box turtle? <laughs> Love the enthusiasm. Does anybody else want to answer or should we, should we let this lovely boy answer again? If somebody's going to answer, go ahead and answer this. I don't want to get it wrong in front of everybody. <laughs> but, um, Let's see. Is he good at boxing? No. No? Yeah, probably not, right? I wish. Huh? Does he make box-shaped nests? Uh, yeah. Wait, Um, they carry it around like a box? That's what my brother told me. So, yes, you did. <laughs> throwing them under the bus. All right. So let's go to the options. So probably we said not the box shaped nest, right? He feels like a swimmer right now. Uh, so they don't like boxing. We said that. So what about C or D? What are you thinking? C. C. I heard the peanut gallery. <laughs> yeah. So that was perfect. Yep. So they are, uh, they are known for just having that box shape when they can actually go fully into their shell. Um, so they're one of the only turtles that can do that when they're fully enclosed. We do have the musk and the mud turtles that do have hinges as well, but their plastron is too small to get everything in. So the box turtles are gonna be the only one that can fully, fully go in their shell. So you can see there's really no bits no mushy parts sticking out waiting to be eaten, right? So these guys are pretty good at that. Um, when it comes to these guys, they've got a little bit of spacing there, right? So the spaces probably aren't that great for their limbs. So that was perfect. All right. What type of turtle is in this image? We got either a river cooter, Eastern mud turtle, <laughs> common snapping turtle, or your spiny soft shell. Oh, we got the mic coming your way. Spiny soft shell. So you said spiny soft shell. So by the look of him, he's not quite the spiny soft shell. So he does have a hard shell and he does have some striping, but it's not quite that of a yellow belly. How about A, river cooter? <laughs> a for river cooter, final answer, yes. <laughs> that was perfect, yep. So he is gonna be a river cooter. Um, one kind of fun thing you can tell um, from a male for a female when it comes to the river cooters and also yellow bellies as well, um, the males always tend to have longer fingernails. So those really long fingernails they like to use for their mating tactics, they'll go up and they'll just kind of vibrate like this in their face. Um, it's a good distraction for what comes next. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of what they do. Uh, so let's see. Which turtle is also named Stink Pot? I think I know somebody in the room who might have an answer. <laughs> you, you can answer again. I love the energy, we're loving it. <laughs> is it D, musk turtle? Yes, it yeah, is D, musk turtle, good job. <laughs> awesome, and that is a really chunky musk turtle. So he's actually a really large one. Um, so normally they are about this size. Um, they don't really get too much bigger than this. Uh, that guy just seemed to have eaten a really big lunch and he's just waiting it out on the basking rock right there. So let's see, what type of turtle is in this image? So we, <laughs> so I can always just walk over with the mic too. So either a spotted turtle, a Florida cooter, B, right? So we got B, Florida cooter, right? So the big thing we can tell is going to be that red striping on the back, right? And he kind of does look like that river cooter, but yet again, he's got a little bit thicker of that shell for those alligators, those little pesky guys. All right, which turtle is, this, I'm breaking my neck. Uh, which turtle is the largest freshwater turtle species in North Carolina? Let's get this side of the room into it. Come on, Mon for Monty's sake. Let's <laughs> well, we got someone. The common snapping turtle. Yes, okay, yeah, 100%. It's gonna be our common snapping turtle. Those guys are massive. If we did have the alligator snapping turtle, they would definitely be in competition, but we do not. He is not native to North Carolina. Uh, lucky for us, because he is terrifying looking. Let's see. 
All right. What turtle is North Carolina state reptile? I heard something could possibly be the correct answer. Would you like a microphone? <laughs> Eastern box turtle. It is the Eastern box turtle, 100%. I tried to kind of throw you guys off with the picture, but you got it. You got it. All right. And then what freshwater turtle species is well adapted to burrow in the muddy banks of ponds and streams? It's kind of in the name. What do you got? You said Eastern mud turtle? Yes, you did get that right. That's 100% correct. It's in the name, but 100%. They love that. Now, that picture is going to be that of a painted, not necessarily the mud turtle, but yet again, I was trying to deceive. All right. And then what freshwater turtle species has an exceptionally long neck and is known for hunting underwater or which it uses for hunting underwater? Yes. So you said either a painted turtle or a common snapping turtle. All right, so we got two options. Can we, you know what? I wanna hear a round of applause for the answers. And I want, okay, so if, if you think it's a painted turtle, clap. If you think it is a snapping turtle, clap. There we go, okay, I'm loving it, 100%. <laughs> All right, so now we're just kind of gonna get away from the quiz. I'm sorry for throwing that in the middle there, but I'm glad we learned. And definitely you learned, um, so <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so basically we're just gonna kind of end with what we can do. So there's some things that we can do whether we are in the position of being an educator or not. Um, so one thing is gonna be habitat protection and restoration. So there are some things you can do whether it is just planting some more native plants to make sure that their resources are gonna be there for them. Um, or you can do things like, um, I know at Crowder, we have a uh, turtle basking uh, little, we have like pallets that we have that are anchored to the ground that have a little uh, mesh on them for them to get up on. So in case they don't have natural basking areas or maybe they're a little too shaded, um, kind of out in the middle of the pond, we do have these options for them to kind of hop up there and get the full sun that they need. Um, and it's also nice that people can see them a little bit better. Um, so another thing is just removing invasive plants and maybe documenting any invasive animals such as the red-eared slider you might come across. Um, so let's see. Another thing is gonna be research and monitoring. So with these guys, um, there are certain studies going on. So there's some citizen science projects that they do where if you take a picture of the carapace and the plasteron of the um, Eastern box turtle, they actually upload it and they track the turtles based off the specific pattern on that turtle. So most of the box turtles have a very unique patterning to them. So if you take a picture of that, it can recognize that and track them. So a lot of the times people would do these kind of mark and recapture uh, tracking system where they would file onto the turtle it's kind of starting to become a little less necessary to do that. So you're able to kind of do it where you don't have to worry about filing them or taking them back with you. So normally with the filing, people would do it on the very marginal scoots. So the out scoots on the turtle and they don't have as much feeling on those. The younger they are, the more feeling they have on those. So they tend not to try to mark those. Um, but now they're having different ways of doing it, such as the different patterning on these guys. Um, so another thing, like I mentioned before with NC State, they do things like their genetic analysis. So they kind of go through, um, grab some of our turtles that might be hybrids or maybe are just full red-eared sliders. Um, and they try to just see how far back the generations go for these guys. Um, another thing they do is um, they'll start by sterilizing some of the invasives and then re-releasing them. So they can still live out their lives, but they're not necessarily adding to the invasive problem. Um, so also, if you're just trying to do something personally, there are other projects and citizen science things where you can upload any uh, you know, behaviors you notice. If you find a box turtle or if you happen to notice one that's just continuously coming around, you can do your own sort of uh, marking, not marking, but you can kind of track them on your own and upload that information for them to have as well. So another thing is community education. So hello, that is what we're doing here today. Um, so I'm glad you guys are educated. Um, a lot of things is things like these talks or even some programming with the public. Um, a lot of other things are just social media posts. I know that every once in a while, I like to hop on the Crowder post and a, a Facebook and post about how to properly move a turtle from one place to another. Um, a lot of the times people will pick them up and try to move them to a more you know habitable habitat. And uh, most of the time when it comes to these turtles, you don't want to do that. They tend to be very 
good with their honing instincts. So if you do move them, they could spend the rest of their lives looking for their home territory and they will continue to cross roads and other dangerous places to get there. So it can be a little dangerous for them if you do move them. Um, a lot of turtles tend to stay within a one mile uh, radius from wherever their home is. Uh, so usually if you can get them within that mile radius, they tend to be okay. Um, but when it comes to different groups like the turtle rescue team, they do make sure if you do bring in a turtle, uh, just mark the exact coordinates of where you found it so they can make sure after they rehabilitate that animal, they can re-release it to the exact place that it was before to help kind of increase its chances for survival. And like we were just saying, rescue and re uh, rehabilitation. So that is my coworker, Walt. He found this guy. Um, he actually was not going to the turtle rescue team for his shell. His shell was actually perfectly healthy. Um, he was going for the abscess in his ear. So it's actually a very common illness with these turtles is um, their ears actually, um, they don't, they don't have go all the way in. They have a protective. So if they do go underwater, it doesn't get all the way in. Um, and sometimes the abscess can form and it just blows out. And all they have to do is drain it, just flush it, and then they can re-release them. So that's what we did with this guy. Um, so the turtle rescue team, their information is kind of down here. They take all native species of turtles. If you did find a turtle like a red ear that was injured, they will take those as well. They just will probably not re-release it. They might just find a home where he can be a permanent pet somewhere and maybe not add to the invasive problem. Um, and they also are working on doing things such as the sterilizing of these guys. So they do a lot of amazing work. I know I've given them a few turtles over the years. They give them really funky names. Uh, we had a turtle that was run over by a lawnmower who was named Mo. Um, super, super great turtle. He was awesome. Uh, but, you know, always make sure that if you do try to help a turtle, you make sure that if you're crossing the road, you just bring him in the direction they're already facing because he'll just turn around and be like, that's not where I was going. And he'll just go right back across the street. So uh, make sure you're just bringing him in the direction he was already going to just aid him in that. But normally don't try to pick them up and bring them anywhere. A lot of the times we'll have issues where people bring box turtles to ponds thinking they're an aquatic turtle. Now they can swim. It's not their normal habitat. Everything needs water. So, you know, being near water is great. But making sure with these guys, they are actually pretty uh, focused in on their honing. So with these guys, it's really important to get them back to that mile radius. Um, so that is all I had for you guys today. Um, if you guys want, we do have Tank over here that I will kind of be carrying around. Um, you guys can kind of meet him and you'll be really be able to see those red eyes up close and all the bright coloring on him. Um, but yeah, you get more coloring on him as they get older. So I'll walk around with him. Feel free to look at everything going on up here. Um, yeah, but thank you guys so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, so just a question online to start things off. Uh, this is from Shannon. Why is the Florida Cooter in North Carolina? Well, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, so he's, uh, they're not invasive. Um, they are just have a really wide range. So they aren't necessarily, they're not invasive. They probably weren't native at some point, um, but when they did come up here, I'm sure that the resources were suitable for them. So they stayed. Um, some animals just tend to have a larger range than others. So these, uh, these guys do have a more kind of vertical range to them. So they go from Florida all the way up towards us. Questions in the room? John, <laughs> Do you still remember? <laughs> What, uh, how old would you say is the lifespan of the alligator snapping turtle? Well, alligator snapping turtles now, they there have been like mark and recapture studies where there's one that has been documented to be about 100 years old. Now, on average, probably not 100 years old. I'd say about probably 50 years old to 55. Um, just with regular predation and like we said, motor vehicle incidents, they don't tend to have as long of a lifespan now that we have um, automobiles. Um, but uh, they do have a longer lifespan than most of our aquatic turtles. Yeah, there, were, there used to be a serpentarium in Wilmington they had a big alligator snapping turtle. It had a uh, depression in its shell. They said it was caused by a musket, uh, musket ball going back to the Civil War. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> a musket ball. <laughs> yeah, well, he definitely, uh, you know, outdates all of us, hopefully. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but they, uh, you know, you can tell probably from the shell that their resilience is really awesome. They can heal amazingly. Uh, like we said, with our bones, if you break a bone, it heals a lot uh, stronger. So it's, with their whole back being a bone, it's very similar. Do we have any other questions? Oh. <laughs> Okay, this is a long question. Um, I'm ready. <laughs> so let's say you were, I've been reading a book. So you're, it's always dangerous okay. when you've been reading a book. 100%. But this lady, Saw Montgomery, she's like my favorite author. But anyway, she was talking about, uh, it's more up north. But anyway, so if I have a pond in our neighborhood and I wanted, and I know there's turtles there, if I wanted to figure out where they're nesting and maybe protect it, how would I even like, start to do that. So when it comes to that, I know that um, at Crowder, um, when it comes to finding turtles nesting, you one, they tend to nest when the soil is a lot, a little bit damp and loose. So they are able to like dig a little better. So if you find kind of around, um, kind of around June, they'll start nesting, like they'll start laying their eggs. Um, so on a damp day like that, they'll come out and they'll, they'll dig. You won't notice after they left, they're really good at covering their tracks. They'll probably bury them about six to eight inches down, like pretty, pretty far. It could be further than that as well. Um, and they're really good at covering back up their tracks. So it's hard to notice unless you're there when they're being laid. Um, okay. A lot of the times when it comes to protecting the turtles, sea turtles definitely protect. I've occasionally protected box turtle clutches as well, just because they are slightly, you know, they're of concern when it comes to their numbers. Um, and they're also our state reptile and I love them. Um, but when it comes to some of our more aquatic turtles, they usually don't need the help. Um, we have a lot of them and they're actually Actually, their eggs are a great source of food for raccoons and, you know, a lot of other animals. So it is really beneficial to also kind of let nature happen. Um, but if you do try to protect them, one thing I have done in the past is I've done chicken wire with very, like probably about an inch or more wide openings on them. So if they do hatch and you are not there, they can get out. Um, but if you're trying to protect the nest itself from being preyed on while they're still in their egg, um, you know, stage, you're able to kind of cover that up where they can't get out. But when they do hatch, it's wide enough for them to be able to escape, which is the big thing. So you really have to see it. See you them. you do. It's, it's, it's hard to no notice. To... It really is hard to notice. And they'll Amazing. pick it up and you might see a little mound that they attempted to put back over. But honestly, I would probably mistake that for a squirrel putting an acorn in the ground. So it's yeah. it's a little difficult to notice unless you're there. But they do tend to have like a clear month or two in which they they went like they'll lay their eggs. So as long as you know when that is, you can kind of go on a damp day and check and they, they'll probably hop out around then. I know this is a turtle talk, but do we have uh, tortoises in North Carolina? We do not. So no tortoises here. The only terrestrial turtle is going to be our box turtle. Um, the closest thing we're going to get. They are pretty close because they're, you know, their hands are a bit different than that of our aquatic turtles. They don't have the webbing. Um, they're a little more flat footed, but they are not quite a tortoise. Um, so and we don't have any native ones here in North Carolina. Hi. <laughs> I've always heard that if you get bit by a snapping turtle, it won't turn loose until it thunders. <laughs> well, if, if you get bit by a snapping turtle and you want it to release, pour water on its head. So if you sprinkle water on its head, if you pour water, if you're near a pond and it happens and you just drag them with you, you know, careful for your thumb, but if you take them with you and you put them underwater, they tend to release the second their head hits enough water. Um, so kind of quick fact, if you happen to have water on you, if not, I'm so sorry, you can cry on them if it hurts enough, um, but it's really the only solution I have in that instance. But normally they will release, don't yank, um, they will bite down harder um, if you fight it too hard. Um, so they have a bite force of about 2000 pounds per square inch. So don't mess with that. <laughs> but if you do get into that scenario, which people do, um, definitely get as like water on their head fast because the second that it gets on them, they think they're underwater and they can release. I think you got a question. Yep, question in the back. I was in upstate New York in September. We were walking between a hospital and a lake. There were several baby snapping turtles which had been run over by a car, but there was one snapping turtle that survived. It looked like it was heading right for the hospital. Maybe it knew more than we did. But uh, I took it and walked it down to the lake. I didn't put it in the lake, but I put it, you know, on the shore. Did I screw up? 
<laughs> Good question. Um, no, you you didn't screw up. So it seems like, as, at least from my understanding, it was close enough of a distance that it, it probably wouldn't mess up their territory. Um, getting them next to the water is great. You don't want to put them directly in the water because sometimes they're just not mentally prepared for that. You know, if somebody dunked me in water and I wasn't mentally prepared, I'd flip out. So <laughs> if you're putting them right next to it was perfect, you give them that option to go in or to be like, this is not my home and turn around. <laughs> Maybe that turtle was a big baseball fan because this happened in Cooperstown, New York. Oh, I, well, then that makes sense. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? Oh, got an online one virtually. Diego has a question here. So what was the program you mentioned for submitting box turtle pictures? Um, it's a citizen science initiative. So if you just type in like citizen science ongoing turtle initiative, it'll pop up. Um, it, you can usually just... Once you find the website, you can go on there and kind of fill out the information yourself and set up an account, and then you can upload those images after you do that. Okay, I've got a really big question for you. Are you ready? Now I am. All right. Shannon is wondering, what is your favorite turtle? Box turtle. Uh, I love my boxies. Um, so they're, they're so cute. They're also very friendly. Um, one thing I love about turtles is that they actually, you know, they have nerve endings in their shell. So if you put them sometimes underneath a sink, they'll just go like this. So they're just like, this is great. So they'll just kind of dance under it. Um, you can also kind of just scratch their shells and they're, they love it too. So it's it's really um, funky with them. Their patterning is really awesome. Um, kind of underrated in my opinion, but they do match that of like a fall floor in the woods. So they are very well camouflaged. But when I come up across them in the woods and I'm like looking around for like a hawk or, you know, a coyote and I'm like, oh, I still love you. And I'm like, and I go up and I'm like, this is so stinking cute. So it's, either way, these guys are my favorite. They are a little uh, underappreciated in my opinion. So I give them all the appreciation they deserve. How do they grow? I mean, how do they, they don't get out of the shell. I mean, how do they Grow. Yeah. So um, whenever they, they do grow, um, they will start shedding their scoots. So when they're, um, this is all bone. So when it starts growing too big and the scoots on top, um, which you can really see here, like all of these will pop off. Um, they probably do about once, maybe twice a year. Um, but these guys all come off when the bone itself is growing to make sure that it still has that protection on it. Um, so you can tell that your, your turtle has grown when these have popped off. Sometimes you can find aquatic turtles where almost their whole back is covered in moss or algae and then just one random spot on them is super clear. Uh, that just means he popped that scoot off and shed it recently. So as their bones are growing, um, they kind of pop these guys off and grow new ones in the same, uh, in a little bit larger of a size to kind of fit their shell. What do you mean they pop these off? What, do you, what is so it? The, the I'm trying to, I was like, I get two handed here. Um, but all of these things, they, they pop off. So this is like their outer their outer patterning and their outer shell. So these guys, as they grow and their bones will start growing, these won't fit anymore. And they just kind of pop off and a new one will already be grown underneath and kind of show through. So um, like when you, when you see a whole dirty shell and then just one that's really clean, that was probably the most recent scoot to pop off. Um, but they do it like once or twice a year. So um, they, they are continuously growing though. So I know common snapping turtles will continuously grow their entire life. There's really not a stopping point until they're done. Um, so they're always shedding and uh, getting new scoots. I got another question about the, the river with the long claws. Yeah. So what do they do? Because I watched it one time on a the lake, they were constantly doing so yeah. So um, the males will have the longer fingernails on the front, um, which they use like to kind of go, they will bring both their hands up like this and go this in the face of the female. Um, so just kind of a, a way of flirting, distraction. Um, and then, you know, they're able to mate. Um, and the females, they don't have the longer ones because they don't need to do that. Um, but they do have um, very thick and strong back legs um, that they use to help make their nests uh, and things like that. So kind of changes with the male and female, but the males are gonna be the ones with those long, thinner fingernails on the front. Um, what are some, other than humans, what are some other predators of turtles? Yeah, um, so not here, but bears. Um, so not quite in Wake County, um, but bears can uh, can attack them. Um, coyotes can do so as well. Um, you can find like when it comes to box turtles, since they're on land, they're open to a little bit more predation um, from coyotes 
or foxes, bobcats, things like that. When it comes to the snapper, not so much. That's why um, normally their eggs and their hatchlings are going to be really in danger. Um, and then when they get to an adult size is when they're kind of considered that apex predator. So nothing is going to come after them when they get to their full grown or at least uh, adult size. Um, they're pretty well protected with their bite force and everything. They can be taken by surprise. There actually have been reported cases of a uh, river otters that have you know, taken over a uh, brew mating snapping turtle. So sometimes during the winter when they are hibernating, they are open for prey because they are so, you know, slow, no energy, no oxygen, that they are just completely into poor, very, very tired. Um, they don't have that energy or ability to like to wake up super fast to protect themselves and otters will find them and have their way. Um, so uh, otters can be pretty aggressive as well, but they will do that. Um, but coyotes are uh, probably when it comes to adults are going to be one of the bigger ones, um, at least here. But normally we are going to be the biggest ones other than like other than us, though, it's going to be probably coyotes and mainly when they're young. And also alligators, but we don't have to worry too much about that. We only have American alligators and not really in Wake County at all. So <laughs> we're pretty good. <laughs> Another virtual. This one comes from Frank. Frank is wondering, are we making progress fighting the illegal pet trade in North Carolina? It's a tough question. Yes and no. Um, so uh, a lot of the times, like I know that we have a lot more policies and regulations that are stopping some of the pet trade, um, like just restrictions and stuff like that. But in general, these pet trades still do happen online. You can purchase a lot of these animals virtually, which is a big issue because they can kind of get away from having to have a lot of permits they need. Um, so we are doing the best that we can. I know that um, our state and our policymakers are helping and they're doing the best that they can to ensure the safety of our turtles. It's just a matter of these other people who are kind of going around the rules and making it happen. Um, so we're doing our best. Do we have any other questions? Let's, let's let's take two more questions. How much is that guy getting paid? You're making him run the mic everywhere. <laughs> How long can turtles go without eating? Um, they can. I mean, they can go about. I mean, on average, they go about three months, but they can go up to about four, five, six months even. Um, but it just depends on the temperature that they're brumating in. Um, the lower the temperature, the lower their metabolism runs. Um, and they get to a point where they no longer need oxygen um, and they can work off of their glucose instead of oxygen. Um, and then that builds up lactic acid that actually gets absorbed into their shell. They have a whole cool process with it, but um, mainly for food, it's about three months averagely but they can go up to about six. Wouldn't recommend it, but they yeah. could. We were told that the Galapagos tortoise can go a year. Oh, well, tortoises are different. <laughs> those, those guys are built like bricks. So they 100% they can go a lot longer than our aquatic turtles can. Um, but usually the amount of energy that goes into brew mating, when they wake up, they do need that food. Last question. <laughs> um, once the turtles have made it, how long before the female lays her eggs? That's a good question. I, I mean, it usually takes, what, about a, like a month or two. Um, so nothing too long. It's definitely not as long as us. Um, but um, it's also not super quick turnaround. But since they are laying eggs, they don't have to worry about it fully developing. Um, so they just kind of pop them out in about a month or two. Um, but it really depends on the species. That can change depending. Um, but I would say about a month or two. Well, I, I think that's it on the questions. Yeah, I, 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 it's amazing. I, I don't dare shake my head. So much information just came in. Thank you so much, Sarah. Let's give it up for Sarah Goldstein. Thank you so much and uh, sharing so much about our reptilian friends here in uh, Wake County. So that is concluding our webinar for tonight. I better stand here so you can see me. Um, and I appreciate everybody, uh, you know, online that joined us tonight. And I hope you'll join us uh, in two months, I think, is our next webinar. Right, John? Yep. The next webinar, though, is two. two. Yeah, the online one. Okay. So anyway, keep, keep, keep a watch on that. Appreciate everybody coming tonight and joining us uh, from near and far here in North Carolina. And that concludes our webinar.